Hey everyone, this is Ross. Today's video, we're doing like a little bit of planning, a little bit of moving some things around, um, updating you guys on where everything's at in the yard. Um, it's really good to plan. And we're gonna go into greater detail into our planning process throughout the winter time when we, we can't really be outside, it's just too cold. In fact, today it's pretty cold. Um, but I'm out here anyway, because I wanna show you guys what we've done so far. So you can kind of see here on the south exposure that you guys are looking at right now. We have all of our fig trees here in the row that we planted out in the spring. We've had some older and more mature trees along the house that have been here. And there's our pomegranate in the corner. Uh, this is our southern exposure. We get the most amount of sun here and the most amount of heat here all year round. You can see this is all quite different now because First off, all the vegetables are out of here. All the annuals are gone. Even some of the perennials. We had some um, sugar cane. We moved the sugar cane over here to this raised bed. We planted more sugar cane, by the way. Go back and see that video if you guys are interested. We also had some artichokes we ripped out. So overall, though, I wanted to make this whole bed for the fig trees. A continuation um, so that we can lay down tarps that go down this way. So we can mass cover them, lay down tarps that also go down this way. And then that way, uh, everything else over here is then dedicated to annuals. And you can see everything's in a raised bed now. And this is only going to aid our crops next year. This is really something really beneficial for a lot of the heat loving crops that I love to plant here. Things that do well here in this particular spot with the amount of heat, with the amount of sun, are things like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants and melons. Um, this raised bed is really gonna aid in the heat. The soil temperature is gonna be increased. What we did is basically just put two raised beds on top of each other. We've had four, a four inch raised bed that went across here and about halfway. It was 10 foot long. And then we had another one that was the other half length of this. It's 20 feet long this whole area here. And we had basically been growing in those two raised beds um, for years. And then we've combined them. We've slowly kind of taken them out. We took this one out last year. And then this year we took this one out. And now I've combined them two together. So now I have one double the height. It's eight inches tall. And we've got the soil, by the way, from a number of our pots. This is all compost. Great amount of nutrients in this stuff. It's well draining. Uh, this is really gonna be nutritious and healthy for our plants going into the upcoming season. We also have two raised beds over here that are smaller. These are, I think two foot by three foot raised beds. And uh, these guys, I have a feeling I'm gonna be planting some figs in here. If you can believe that, I think I'm actually going to be planting some fig trees in raised beds. Once again, we had them in these raised beds in prior years. We put one uh, in a raised bed that was a foot high. And I think these are actually a foot high now and it survived the winter and it really performed incredibly well in the, in the growing season itself. So I think it's going to be even better than planting these figs in these mounds that I have them in. We still need to add lots of rock down in this area, but uh, it's gonna be even better, I think, and outperform the in-ground trees that are just planted in a, a normal sized mound because now we have a whole foot of soil that's getting warmed up, just like these peppers and eggplants and tomatoes, all that's getting warmed up. Um, and then this section here, we have no fig trees in here. This is going to go for our melons. We're going to have our trellises. You can see the trellises right there. There's a number of them. We're going to stack them up on top of each other and create a, a trellis system in here. Get the melons off the ground and grow them vertically. And uh, that will be our melon crop for the year, for next year. Um, in this raised bed, it's going to be all annuals. And I, I'm considering maybe I should do some more melons as well. Uh, I'm not entirely sure because growing melons vertically like I did last year didn't work out because of our cucumbers and the cucumbers attracted the cucumber beetle which then spread Fusarium wilt and it was a mess. 
Um, I don't know. We're going to see what crops we end up growing in here. We'll talk a lot about that in the winter time. But if I come over here and show you guys, we have some, uh, some strawberry plants that we moved over here. This is the purple wonder down there underneath our peaches. And those guys will spread out. That's a June bearing type. Same thing down here. This is the Rucker Scarlet strawberry. I like the June bears a lot because the June bears will fruit once and that's it. Uh, I have my ever bearing on the other side of the fence is the Mar de Bois. And those do wonderful and they fruit for me for a long period of time. But I can't be out there every day picking them. So I need to limit the number of Mar de Bois plants I have this year. We're also going to be planting, uh, we're not going to be planting more grapes, but I'm thinking about ripping out my European grapes and planting instead muscadines. We'll see, we're going to give them one more year to see if they can fight off black rot. And that black rot is supposed to be very, it's supposed to be easy to avoid it if you bag your grapes. We're going to try bagging them this year. We tried a really harsh chemical last year that was not organic and I didn't even really want to use it, but I had heard good things and it still didn't work. So we're gonna bag them. We'll give it one more year. We moved actually some of the honeyberries out of here. We had some honeyberries underneath the grapes. We had one there, one here. We moved them to different areas of the yard. I'll show you guys in a minute. Here's our garlic and how this is looking so far. It's looking actually really good. Um, some of it is a bit slower to come up, unfortunately. You can see how some of that's barely just coming up. But it's all coming up and that's good. That's a good sign. Um, we still have a little bit longer of some cooler weather or some, um, some weather that we can grow in. But pretty soon this garlic here is gonna stop growing completely um, if it already hasn't already, you know. Um, as soon as it gets to a certain temperature here, the garlic pretty much slows down. The whole goal is to get the garlic in the ground here to a, a reasonable state. I think about something like this is probably the best. Something like that is really what we're going for. Some of these actually may be a bit tall. Too much growth, perhaps. We're going to mulch all this in really well. Uh, keep this insulated throughout the winter time. And then... Um, yeah, they'll, they'll resume growth sometime in the early spring and we'll get a crop uh, by late June, early July. We did build our, our uh, what is this thing? A, uh, basically a, a greenhouse, but not a greenhouse. And you can see underneath here, we put our plastic down. I finally got myself some greenhouse plastic and we got ourselves underneath all kinds of like bok choy and we have arugula down in here and this is supposed to be a cold frame but the uh the plastic that you see got blown off we had staples we stapled the plastic to the wood and that really didn't work out the only reason it's still hanging on on this section here is because i wrapped the plastic underneath and then stapled it and that was a big mistake. I think I need to do that with, uh, with all sides of it. You know, on the left side, the right side, and then on the back here, this back panel. Wrap it underneath and then staple. But the issue is that now this piece of plastic is not long enough. <laughs> so you basically, what I'd recommend everybody out there doing something with the, with the cold frame or a greenhouse, make sure you give yourself more plastic than you need. Uh, considerable amount more plastic. I think that's a great recommendation. Uh, we have our little mushroom patch here of shiitakes that we've been putting down. We inoculated this. In fact, I went through this. I'll show you guys. Let's dig down in here for you guys. This mushroom patch has really gone pretty incredible. Um, let's get in here and see. Maybe actually this is not where I had inoculated. Yeah, I didn't inoculate this just yet. I have to bring you guys up further. Bring you guys up a little bit further here. So I was digging around in here, planting some things, and I was astounded by how much this stuff has 
really um, progressed with the mycelium in here. Um, yeah, this is actually not the best that I've seen, oddly. But some of this has looked really, really incredible in terms of that mycelium has already spread. You can see it right in here pretty well. All that white stuff is really spreading out and propagating itself incredibly well. I'm shocked. This is uh, pretty well inoculated here. And all this will eventually spread and create more mycelium and it'll create more mushrooms for me down the road. That's really what we want out of this section here, this area. And another area of the yard to get this whole thing into a mushroom patch of shiitakes. This is the uh, shiitake patch. Um, pretty much everything you can see around just doesn't have any leaves on it, you know. Um, I do want to do a video showing you guys how to uh, espye some trees because we have those plums against the fence right there that will be espyed. We'll show you guys how to do that sometime probably in the spring when I do my pruning of the stone fruits. You know, kind of get it to the form of what these, these peaches look like, but even better. I mean, um, these peaches were really the first form first trial and error I had with this technique and uh, it worked out well for the first time doing it I'm not gonna lie I gotta give myself some credit but it could be better it could be a better form uh, a little bit of extra specific techniques I think will really help obviously the experience of doing it and I guess the last thing here I want to leave you guys with um, because there's not really a whole lot else going on out here. Maybe we'll do another separate video, but the last thing I want to leave you guys with is actually this persimmon. And um, this thing is incredible, guys. This is a Rosianca persimmon. I grew this guy myself. And uh, it has been a while to figure out when to pick these. I'm sorry, when... When to, actually, I guess when to pick these, but also when to eat them. Because the majority of them that I've been eating actually have been astringent. They have never lost some of that astringency. And I think the reason for that is pretty simply because they got hit with a frost. If I bring you guys over to my Rosianca, I don't think we have to do that, but I'll bring you guys over here to my other persimmon is that they got hit with a frost. Our first big hard freeze. Actually, our first big light frost, I think. Then I harvested them. Off this particular tree, this is proc. And proc, actually, I was able to harvest the persimmons off of this very early. It's one of the earliest persimmons, especially in terms of Americans, in terms of Asians. It's one of the earliest. This guy was all right. He didn't get hit with any frost because all the fruit ripened before the frost. However, my Rosianca got hit with that frost. And some of the fruits, I think, were adversely affected by that frost. And Rosianca, because it's a later ripening persimmon, I should have left them longer on the tree. Um, you know, every persimmon, I think, is different. All of them behave differently. They need to be picked at different times. They... Um, have different astringency levels. It's it's a tough and interesting thing. But this one in particular, I think for the future, I just need to leave it on the tree a lot longer. And it would have ripened up better on the tree. And uh, some of these I've read and I've heard, you can even leave them on the tree all the way till the spring of next year. <laughs> all the way till March. There's some of them that just take that long to ripen. But this one's basically perfect here. I want to take a bite. This guy is going to be incredible. This is what we do. This is why we grow all this food here, guys. Look at that. Ain't that looking like something real sweet, really persimmon-like. Super gooey. 
because they got hit with that frost, some of them didn't ripen properly and they needed to ripen on the counter for a very long time. It seemed like they were soft, but they weren't. In fact, the frost had actually artificially ripened. It seemed like artificially ripened some of them, but when you bite into them, even though they're, they appear soft, they look like they're shriveling up, they are indeed not, and they're, they were quite astringent. So let's taste this one. Oh yeah. Wow. Holy moly. There is one seed there. Wow, that is good. It's thick and gooey and jammy. My goodness, is that good. Look at that on my thumb. Whew. This is one of the best fruits, guys. I'm sorry. Mm. Wow. That's incredible. Well, it just goes to show you guys, uh, you want the good fruit, you want to eat well, you got to grow it yourself. You got to get it at home. You got to plant yourself a persimmon. This is just nuts. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, man. It's got like a date-like flavor to it. It's super sweet. It almost tastes like a marshmallow. It's so gooey, gooey and jammy. Oh my God. Anyway, guys, I'm getting cold out here. Hopefully you're convinced at this point. We'll see you all soon, all right? And uh, we'll see you for tomorrow's video. Take care, everyone. Check out our blog, figboss.com. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll catch you all soon, all right? Take care, everyone.